Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Motivational Millennial Podcast. Today we're talking with Colleen Kinder. I met Colleen in New York a couple years ago and was immediately captivated by her incredible stories of travel and adventure. And turns out she is a travel writer, and she shares some great wisdom in this interview about the power of stories, the power of using your own curiosity to find your path and to learn more about the paths of others. And she's actually doing that work, capturing those stories through her project off assignment, which is really exciting. So stick around after the interview. Ivy and I will share some of our key takeaways, and we hope you enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the Motivational Millennial Podcast, where we discuss living life with a sense of purpose with members of the millennial generation who are doing just that. I'm Ivy LeClaire. And I'm Blake Brandis. Our Motivational Millennial guest today is Colleen Kinder. Colleen is a travel writer and photographer and is the author of Delaying the Real World, a book about avoiding cubicle life after college. Colleen's work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The New Republic, The Wall Street Journal, and National Geographic Traveler, among many others. In 2013, Colleen co-founded Off Assignment, a nonprofit and online publication devoted to the stories behind Glossy Magazine and front page news stories. Colleen, welcome to the show. Thank you. So excited to be here with you guys. Well, we appreciate you being here, in person, nonetheless. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, will you tell us a little more about the work you're doing right now with Off Assignment? Sure. Well, we are hoping to launch a website and to put together a print publication, like a debut collection of all the great writing we have assembled in two years of talking to journalists about the concept of Off Assignment and fomenting excitement and just kind of tapping people for these specific stories they have about the tales that are still sort of haunting them and lingering after their official news assignment. Sometimes years after going to Iceland, for example, a reporter will still be thinking about that cab driver in Iceland or that person they met. So we're putting together a print issue that I'm really excited about. It's coming together little piece by little piece, and all of a sudden we're putting in visuals, and I'm emailing the PDF to everyone. It's just really exciting to see something like that come together and to see all the great ideas that have accumulated because it really has been such a collaborative process with so many writers who really feel like there needs to be a venue and a platform for these untold stories that are still with you after you turn in your assignment. Awesome. And can you take us a little bit to the journey up to off assignment. So as we heard in the introduction, you've done travel writing, you've done photography. Mm. Can you take us just a little bit up to that moment when you got inspired to found Absolutely. off assignment? So I was teaching at Yale. I was teaching a travel writing course, a small class, and I invited Pico Iyer, a writer I adore, a travel writer, to come speak to my students. And as discussion leaders do, I assigned three of his essays for the students to read. And my students read those essays, and I assumed he would want to do some sort of literary analysis of them or talk about specific writing choices. Totally the contrary. He said, kind of like, let me handle this, and just sat in front of my students and started telling the stories behind these essays and these articles. And specifically, I mentioned Iceland a couple beats ago because his story about Iceland, about meeting a woman who he became pretty enraptured with in a platonic way. This woman who he met at a cafe ended up sort of being his guide through his reporting trip. And they spent these very intense days together while he was working on, I believe, a Condé Nast Traveler feature about Iceland. So you know, we're listening to this and we're just like all like eating out of the palm of his hand, like on the <laughs> end of our seats. And at one point I sort of perhaps impertinently interrupted him and said, have you ever written this story? And he said no. And something about the way he said no affected me and stuck with me. And I might have been projecting on him because at that point in time, I was doing my own travel writing and I just turned in a piece to the Wall Street Journal about the Rio San Juan in Nicaragua. And they fact checked me and style clobbered me so heavily that at the end of the day, I wasn't really proud of what I turned in. And I felt like I didn't tell the real story. And I was thinking to myself, what am I doing this for? 
like, what will this all accumulate into? When I'm an 80 year old lady, will I be ashamed of these little pieces? Or will I just have forgotten about them? And will I feel like I haven't actually told the stories I was pursuing? So I was just feeling something very particular, my kind of dissatisfaction. And what he said cut right to it because I thought to myself, okay, if this legendary travel writer who's had every opportunity available to him, who gets all the space in glossy magazines, still has some of his most important stories lingering inside of him, then there's a problem. There's a platform that's missing. And I happened that just the term off assignment just kind of alighted. And I happened to do a web search just to see if that URL was available. And it was. And I purchased it for about $10 or $11. And something about having that little piece of web real estate in my hand made me walk the idea further and talk to people about it. And I went to a few readings in New York where there were journalists and I just started casually asking people, when you return home from a reporting assignment, do you often feel like you haven't told the real story? And everyone across the board said yes. And I'm an idea person. I come up with ideas all the time. However, the way this was resonating with people and the degree to which it was resonating widely made me feel like I had to do something with it. Wow, that's incredibly inspirational how something from that little moment, that little inspiration, created this entire vision. It's awesome. Yeah, and I should credit a student in my course who the Monday after Pico visited came in and just echoed everything that I had felt in that discussion. Mm -hmm. He was like, man, I want to read that Iceland story. That's the version that I want to read. So, um, you know, sometimes I think we doubt our own reactions to things Mm -hmm. and think, oh, that's just my personal take. But hearing a college student say the exact same thing made me think, okay, like something's up. That's awesome. Well, here at Motivational Millennial, we definitely are interested in what are those moments and those things in your life that get you motivated and inspired. And so on a light note to start off here, what is one song that gets you motivated and hyped up? We're big fans of music here at Motivational Millennial. and We're curious, is there a song that just when it comes on, you're thinking, wow, like gets you really going? You know, when I was in grad school and working on just long writing projects for months and months and months, the song One Shot, who is that singer who is like kind of like a white rapper from Detroit, I think. Eminem? Eminem, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. That guy. Uh, Yeah, so. That is the most amazing roundabout way to get to Eminem I think I've ever heard. That's amazing. (laughs) So Eminem, the song, like, I have specific memories of stepping out of my, like, little yellow house on Market Street in Iowa City and, like, queuing that up and just, like, bounding down the sidewalk. And it just made me feel like I could do anything. And it was, like, a little bit edgy. It wasn't cheesy. I like that, that it was motivating, but it was also sort of acknowledging, like, you're in the trenches. You got to fight. Great. Yeah. Lose Yourself is one of the most iconic songs, like rap songs from a movie sort of, <laughs> yeah. of all time. That's so awesome. <laughs> it does get you Perfect. Going. And we're not going to edit any of the getting to that because that was so amazing. We're just gonna <laughs> yeah, it all in. Seriously, I've revealed absolutely. a lot in that. <laughs> no, that was so good. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Colleen, do you have a morning routine or a series of things that you can do in the morning that when you do that, you know you're going to end up having a good day? So a couple things. One is that I write gratitudes. I've gotten a little lazy about it recently, but just 10 things that went well from the day before, really specific things. And it can be something like, I was late for my podcast interview, but they weren't mad at me. You know, like it it can be that I heard back from that editor, anything that went well that could have gone wrong. There's something nice about casting a glance back before you look forward that I find just really powerful because as someone who's just, I think, wired to look forward and to wake up hungry to do things, I think it's important to also check yourself at the door of a day and say, okay, like things are going well. And the things that I did yesterday plant seeds for today or set me up well for today. The other thing I do is I've become really precious about my notebooks and When I sit down to work, before I even open my email and let the world start yelling at me, I do some sort of list making, aesthetically pleasing list making, not like (laughs) jot down on a post-it note, 10 things so you can cross them off. I like, (laughs) honestly, I use like pastels and there's something about that soothes me. And when I look back on my notebooks, 
I feel it's a reminder that I was happy when I was working and that mm-hmm. I'm just sort of a big believer that the way we spend the hours is the way we spend our lives. And when I want to look back and just be reminded that I had creative days and even when I was in this mode of doing things, I was taking a second to enjoy myself. So that's something about that recently has been hugely helpful to me. And it just calms my jitters. Like I just wake up with a racing mind and just want to like do a million things. And I feel like the inbox can make you feel scattered in terms Mm -hmm. of where you're going to put your energy. So I feel like I sort of, it's a way of like pulling into a cave and being like, okay, we're ready for the day. (laughs) Like we can handle this. But before we let the world tell us what to do, we figure out what we want to do. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's such a creative way because it's, it's like thinking positively, like you're saying, creating that list because I do lists, but thinking of it in that way where you get to have fun creating the list at the time kind of sets it into you're looking back and it's not just like, oh, this is a bunch of tasks that I have to do. But yeah, you're looking back, oh, that pretty list I made. And that's the tone. That's such a brilliant idea. And it's fun to like color in the boxes (laughs) next to the item. You know, I bring out the like burnt yellow like crayon and I color in or I shade in the to do's with this nice pencil as opposed to just crossing it off. Mm -hmm. It just makes it a little project as opposed to like a... A grind. That's a great idea. Fantastic. Colleen, could you share a motivational quote or phrase that has really affected you? Sure. So I do think I'm on a kick of remembering that the way we spend our hours is the way we spend our lives. I do think that's really powerful. I was recently living on a ship, so I was stuck in the same place with a lot of other people, and there was a man named John who was a wise old soul who just made me want to like tap him for all the wisdom that he had. He was very attuned to my dilemmas about off assignment and these misgivings I had about taking on something as huge as founding a magazine and bringing people together and being a manager of a group of volunteers because I am a writer as well. And so I constantly felt conflicted about this. And One day we're hanging out on the ship where you just have tons of time and can talk life. And I was just very honest with him. And I said, I don't know if I'm the right person for this. And he said to me what a boss had told him once. You might not be the perfect person for the job, but there's nobody better. And that really resonated with me. And I thought, it just immediately struck me as true. Hmm. I am not the perfect person for the job, but... I'm the best one to just get this going. And so it was very motivating and has really stuck with me. Another thing that he said is that life only makes sense backwards or your life path only makes sense when you look back at it. And I do think that correlates so well with something that I always try to impart on my students or anyone who asks me, should I be a writer? What should I do with my life? I just often say like, your internal compass is all you have. You can only follow your gut instincts day by day, month by month, year by year. You don't know where it's going, but if you follow your instincts at 22, it will lead you in the direction of something you want at 28, which will set you up well for something you want when you are 36, <laughs> and so on and so on. And But you can't see to 36, or you can't mm-hmm. see to 55. But when you look back, you will think, oh, yeah, that thing I did when I was 22, it was so related to what I got into later. So those are a couple of things that really have resonated with me. That's awesome. I think that really speaks to... The idea of, you can say following your passion, but I like the way you say the, the voice within you, um, your inner compass. Yeah. Because it won't make sense now, and that's okay. I think there's so much pressure to think, not only do I have to have the now figured out, but I have to have the future figured out right, as well. Right, and right. so releasing some of that, I think, can help people take what is the next step that I can take right now in mm-hmm. that direction mm-hmm. versus trying to guess where that destination is because like you said if at any point in our lives know. we said where do we think we're going to be in five years compared to where we actually ended up totally different totally different and the wacky things you do when you're younger can actually sort of catapult you into this thing you want more powerfully than the obvious straightforward path in an odd way i was just asked to apply to be like a travel columnist for a publication. And I thought to myself, man, if I had just worked in a newsroom, 
when I was 20 years old and all the way through my 20s, no way I would have been a candidate for this. It was because I just went off into the world and let it inspire me and then tried to package those experiences that 10 years later, I'm someone who comes to mind in Manhattan in an office as someone who could potentially be a travel columnist. So I didn't know it, but following my gut, I was launching myself further than I would have had I tried to plan everything out. That's amazing. So as you're looking back on this path and thinking of all of these moments, is there a moment that stands out to you? Is that defining moment that kind of set you on your purpose or helped you realize what your passion was and got you moving forward? So I'm going to do something crazy and refer to Monday, which is four days ago. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure you guys were expecting me to say when I was 24 or last a decade ago because I think this story is powerful. I, on Monday morning, I will be vague about the root of all this. I had a little bit of a health scare and I did what a lot of people in the modern age do. I did some like web research and I went to the place of panic and I really, I was just convinced on a Monday morning in my office, out of the blue, After having a gorgeous morning and feeling so alive, I was convinced that my time would be limited, that basically I would have a year or six months to live. And (laughs) I'm totally fine. I've just been to the doctors this morning. Don't worry about me and don't give me concerned glances. But anyways, what I did immediately was take out my notebook and write down what I would do if my time was limited. And it was unbelievable how quickly things came into focus. It was so clear career-wise what I would spend that year doing, what I would say absolutely no to. It was so clear how I would administer my emotional energy and who I would invest that in. Amazingly, travel was something that I was not going to do as a travel writer. That might sound bizarre, but I've been to 15 countries in 2015. And I thought to myself, that's good. Like I've seen a (laughs) a sizable chunk of the world for someone my age. And we can just spend this time working on what we've gathered. And I do think as morbid as it may sound, I think it's really powerful every now and again to think about what you would do if your time was limited. It put a lot of things into relief for me and The work week sense has felt very clear and I'm delegating more at off assignment. I'm getting back into writing projects with focus and I'm speaking differently to the people in my life and that feels good. What a powerful exercise. I was just (laughs) thinking that's a great personal development tool just to be able to use for anybody. Yeah, absolutely. And in a sense, like what great timing for you to be able to be here and share this. Like, I feel really blessed by that, you know, by that experience and appreciate you. And I'm alive too. Yeah, exactly. Like you're here (laughs) and feeling even more alive knowing that you have that. So that's great. Just that clarity. And that's amazing. That's very powerful. I do remember a friend who lost her mother at a pretty young age saying that one of the things her mother said when she was dying of cancer was, I wish that everyone could have this awareness of life without having to die. Mm -hmm. And it just, how do you get that? Well, you go online and (laughs) Google search any uh, health problem you have and it'll convince you that you're dying and then just have a freak out. And then the next day, like, go back at it. Yeah, that's amazing. It can be so powerful to read about the things that people say on their deathbed, which is very rarely, you know, wish I had more money or something. It's always about experiencing life and relationships and all of those things and yeah. Kind of puts it in perspective a little bit. Great TED Talk about that. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it. It's really great. The person who's presenting runs through like the top five things that people do say on their deathbed. And one of them is that I wish I didn't work so hard. Yeah. Doesn't that resonate? It's a little haunting. I know. <laughs> Especially in our culture, we really feel like that's the bad, that's uh-huh. the sticker on our shoulder there. So yeah, that's very powerful. Wow. So on this journey that you've been on, what is the biggest challenge that you say you faced and how did you overcome it? I would say that my biggest challenges have all been internal crises of faith, not understanding my own gifts or underestimating them, struggling with despair as a writer. This whole strategy I mentioned about 
decorating my notebooks was, it was born of trying to overcome these experiences of writing so, so much when I traveled in a really sort of rash and soulful way, but then coming back to the desk later and being overwhelmed by how much I'd gathered and not wanting to open my notebooks and actually turning on my own work, which is complicated and there's no guidebook about that. And so I, this is just the best that I could come up with to kind of soothe my fears in the moment of writing, but also situate myself well to reckon with what I had gathered while in motion. So that is just something that I've just figured out. I mean, I think there comes a point in your career where you say, okay, I've got these weird tics. No one can explain them. Very few people experience the same thing. And I've just got to know the strange animal that I am and develop a system to figure that out and to overcome it. I will be honest, I have definitely struggled with despair. There have been periods of my life when I felt really down and I've just done a lot of work to be self-compassionate, personal care, and just be less hard on myself. And, and I think there are a lot of us who are just afflicted with this kind of, I don't know what to call it, just being hard on yourself unnecessarily mm -hmm. and not being patient and just bearing down unnecessarily. And I think meditation helps. I think honestly, therapy helps and mm -hmm. having a voice in your life that points out what you're doing right and just shows you how you could be more merciful with yourself. And I hesitate to admit this, but there was a certain point in which I decided to believe that I was a badass. <laughs> and I just felt like, okay, if I believe this, maybe it will come true. And it was in part influenced by a sermon at a Unitarian church that I actually didn't hear. I heard about secondhand and the minister said something to the effect of there was a certain point in her life where she decided that like socks were one thing that she would just count on the people in her life to supply. I don't fully understand this, but basically the idea was she let her family know that she would love socks for Christmas or socks were something that a way that she could be treated and she just trusted that she would have socks to put on her feet and sure enough like that has played out and it's sort of a weird example but it really stuck with me as like when you message to the universe that you trust in something or you believe in something I just feel like oftentimes it is self-fulfilling and there was a moment when I was teaching and opportunities were starting to come at me that I would have freaked out about when I was younger. And I think I just decided to believe, yeah, I can give a lecture. I grew up believing that I was shy and would never be a great public speaker, but hey, maybe I can give a great lecture. And sure enough, the first lecture I gave I put a ton of work into it, but, and I talked myself up to the challenge a lot, but it went so well. And now I can believe that I have that musculature. And if there's one thing I try to pass on to all my students, it is always give yourself room to surprise yourself. And I think that is probably the central tenet of my life in terms of self-development. If you, you can hem yourself in so easily and say, I can't do this, or I need this, and other people can do that, but I can't, or my sister's the one who could do this, or a teacher told me early on that I can't do this. You're just putting on your own straitjacket, and truly, we can do anything we want. It's such a cliche, but it's <laughs> so true. And like, I remember breaking my ankle at one point in time and being petrified. I had just fallen in love, and I was petrified as people are in that particular moment about gaining weight. And I thought, Lord, if I can't even walk, how on earth am I going to? keep my shape. So I just started doing like core strength workouts and had always been my weakness. I hated that Bernie feel in my abdomen. Never thought I would do that stuff. It was so awesome. I like, <laughs> now I do it every single day. And you never could have convinced me that that would have been something I could do. And so little experiences like that, I think add up and you start to realize that like you had this fixed idea of your own capabilities when you were younger and like you do such a disservice to yourself if you like lock that in and you don't pick it apart and challenge it. Wow. 
there is so much amazingness in everything you just yeah, said. Yeah, it's just a, a testament to you. I mean, that you believe that and then consistently act on that belief as well. And it's so interesting what you say about trusting the universe being able to provide for you because that ties into what you were saying earlier about trusting your internal compass yeah. and knowing that the universe might be providing this opportunity in front of you and it's your internal compass that if you're really listening to it and you have discernment and all of these things and you're practicing that, that's going to allow you to take that opportunity. It's uh -huh. like working with the universe in that way. Yeah. That's really cool. It's insightful. I love the idea too of creating an empowering identity. Like you said, what if I can be the badass mm -hmm. and then acting as if you are and yeah. then watching <laughs> the universe respond accordingly. Yeah. yeah. I think it, you know, it's sort of the fake it till you make it idea, mm -hmm. but I think... There has been nothing truer. Even when we were starting up the motivational speaking business, to your point about speaking, it was like, can we rock a room of 2,000 students? Like, I don't know, but we're not going to know until we try. And then right. you just say, well, what if we did? And what if it goes really well? And I think asking yourself some of those empowering questions, like you said, how can I still surprise myself? Or what if I were a great speaker? What would I do yeah. if I didn't worry? Because I think you're right. It's the fear that's so paralyzing. The fear, right? Yeah, I remember a friend who I consider a great public speaker telling me that he gets nervous when he steps up to do any public speaking. And that was a game changer for me, knowing that someone who looked so poised and confident and almost like he reveled in public speaking. And I had put him in this other category of people who are comfortable <laughs> in front of crowds, and I've never put myself in that category. When a teacher used to call on me in class, I would just blush up to here. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't consider myself in that category. And he took it a step further and said, if you don't feel some kind of adrenaline, you're actually doing something wrong. Like there should be a way in which like adrenaline is a way that your body is like gearing up for something. So consider that actually normal and don't read it as a sign that you're not equipped to do the thing that you're about to do in like two minutes, yeah. right? Like yeah, don't totally. create a freak out by misreading your body. One of the quotes I love from a public speaking training I did was, the nervousness means you care, which I yeah. think is really great. Because I said, if you're not nervous, it means you don't care about your audience. Right. Or so, you think it's in the bag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's so amazing. So I feel like you've spoken a lot to us about how to overcome challenges whenever you're pursuing your dream and pursuing your passion. But for those of us who are struggling to find that sense of purpose and find the passion, do you have any advice that you'd like to give? I guess I would recommend diversity and bravery. Throwing yourself into situations in which you have no idea what's going to come at you. Because I think that when we don't have our bearings, we're most open. And that's one of the reasons I love to travel. I'm such an <laughs> open, porous, dilated human being. And I'm so much nicer and, and lovelier when I just like throw myself into the streets of Cairo or just show up in Reykjavik. And everyone's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. Um, and so I think putting yourself in a situation in which you are very awake and alert is probably the most helpful thing if you don't have like a program or everything mapped out or a strong mm -hmm. instinct on what's the first thing you should do. I've never heard of anyone who does something like random and challenging and like alien to them be hard on themselves or regret it. Like that's very uncommon. I feel like what people regret is doing something very conservative in terms of a job that's easy for them or staying close to home or it's rare that the wild card is the thing that people regret. In fact, I kind of wish I'd done more random stuff in my twenties, <laughs> you know, just to have those stories. And like, as a writer, it's particular because your life is your story, but a few random things that I've done, I just draw on all the time. And I kind of wish that, I don't know, I had like, waited tables at like some weird restaurant or I don't move to Antarctica. There are some things that would have been really rich to have just like thrown myself at. Mm -hmm. mm. 
It's something powerful there about the retrospective, and I think it alludes to something you said earlier, which is we always feel like, oh, when I was younger and more carefree or less encumbered, I wish I had been done to really crazy things. But that time is always now, you know what I mean? Right. Like, we are always that person now. I think an interesting way to use huh. the retrospective to our advantage, too, is imagine, yeah, 10 years from now, am I going to look back on this and say, oh, you totally should try to start up that business yeah. or randomly show up in some country or, or ask that person out or whatever that thing yeah. is. It seems scary right now, right, right. but I think there's a an acronym version of what you're saying that I really love, which is DIFFS. And that's um, sort of a, a companion to YOLO, you only live once. Uh, diffs is do it for the story. Huh. Um, and so huh. you can combine the two to make really bad decisions. Right, like, right. Uh, you know, it's like, hey, yo, should we go out and party till 3 a.m. on top of this mountain and, like, blow off some fireworks with our hands? Be like, YOLO diffs. You know? so, so I feel it can be used for, like, some yeah. questionable advice. But in the broader sense of life, yes. I think diffs is a really powerful and empowering way to say, you know what? It doesn't matter what the outcome is. We're going to get a great story out of it. Right. Although I think there's a flip side to that. And going back to my crisis of Monday, one of the things that flipped into clarity for me was a job that I was in the running for that I absolutely wouldn't take. And the reason was, if I'm really honest with myself, I wanted to have done that job. I didn't want to do that job. Ooh. And I worried that I didn't actually get the offer for the job, <laughs> but I worried that I wasn't quite wise enough to recognize that, that I would have gotten a little seduced by the prestige of the job. And I think it's a mistake people make all the time. There's something that has a kind of luster, not just to them, but everyone in their community, like, ooh, that company or that publication, like, big deal. So if you work for them, you've arrived. I still felt sort of vulnerable to making a choice based on wanting to be aligned with a certain institution or to have done this cool thing. And that's really dangerous mm -hmm. because it would have meant spending a year of my life at least doing something that I actually, when you got down to the nitty gritty, I didn't want to do. And mm -hmm. when you think you only have a year of your life left, <laughs> all of a sudden that job looks very different. So I think there's a flip side to that. Yeah, all of a sudden everything seems like diffs when you look at it from that perspective. And it's how can we have that lens of do it for the story combined with what is our heart really calling us to do? Yeah. And what are we really being honest about? And that's where like that self-compassion that you're talking about mm -hmm. and being kind to yourself helps because there is less judgment on what you might actually want to do versus what you perceive would be the most prestigious or, you know, maybe a little bit more compassion for what's really pulling you in right. that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So earlier when we were talking a little bit about music, you were saying, ask me about books. And so I want to ask you then if you had to pick a book or a couple of books that you would recommend to our listeners that would help them either find their purpose or stay motivated whenever challenges happen, or, you know, if there's something that is inspiring to you that you would recommend funny that you asked this because I was just thinking the other day that when people ask me what my favorite books are, I think what I do is answer a different question. I think mm -hmm. I answer the question, what are the books you've needed most to move forward in your own mm -hmm. life? And I think those are the books, those books are the ones in which writers who have kind of a similar composition to me have like sort of written their best work. I'll offer an example. A Polish journalist named Rizard Kapaczynski, who few people have heard about, was for years a foreign correspondent in Africa. And like, he was on the ground for every major coup and overthrow and transition in the 1950s through the 1970s. I mean, he just saw so much and he was constantly sending back dispatches to Poland about what was happening. But he also wrote on the side these amazing, lush, high personality, super voicey essays, some of which are kind of experimental. And I would argue that that is the work of Kapuscinski's that has endured. He's made a great contribution to what I would call travel writing or more, I guess, maybe long form journalism or more experimental journalism. Some people criticize him and say that his writing verges on fiction and that he took too many liberties. But when I came across his writing about Liberia during the summer that I was in Liberia, it just 
blew my mind and made me feel like there was so much more room in the nonfiction genre. His story more than anything, honestly, I don't know that I would shove this book in everyone's hands because I just think it had something specifically to offer me. And I do teach one of his essays, but I wouldn't say that I consider him the best writer of all times. But his life story just really spoke to me. And I mean, you really could call him sort of the patron saint of off assignment. I mean, truly, <laughs> he was practicing off assignment in his notebooks mm-hmm. all the time. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. This was great. Great. Well, we want to provide you an opportunity to just tell people where they can find out more about you and your work online. Or Thank you for asking. Well, that's so <laughs> kind. Well, my website is quite easy. It's ColleenKinder.com. Great. Yes. And off assignment, similarly, also easy, off assignment.com. So (laughs) I'm fortunate that there are very few Colleen Kinders in the world. Um, There is a designer in Chicago who is creeping up in the Google search results, but I am determined to keep her down and dominate so people can find me and email me. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for being here, Colleen. Really appreciate it. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is supported by Motivational Millennial Coaching Services. We help you find clarity and confidence so you can take action toward living your dream life. To learn more about one-on-one personalized support from someone who believes you have a path to fulfillment and wants to help you uncover it, visit motivationalmillennial.com slash coaching. Wow, that was awesome. Great conversation. Yeah, it was really good. And it was so nice to have her here in person and be able to engage with her like that. There was just so much wisdom there that she gave. And uh, as she was speaking, it just really reminded me, one, is how much I love doing this and how much I love getting to hear from people, in part because it's sometimes reminding me of things that I need to hear too. (laughs) Um, And I was just really reflecting as she was speaking how much what she was saying was something that I actually really needed to hear today, which is amazing. And so I'm really hoping that some of you all are experiencing that as well. And for me, one of the things that was the most helpful was when she was talking about her quotes, which I thought it was really interesting that the quotes that she thought of was something that someone just told her Mm -hmm. (laughs) rather than it's amazing the things that you remember rather than one of the many quotes that we see online and that sort of thing, which I love, don't get me wrong, but I thought that was interesting. And the quote was essentially that you may not be the perfect person for the job, but you're the best person for the job or the most right person for the job. And that really struck me because to me, what he was saying to her is that you may not have every single skill set ever that you need to accomplish this, but what you do have is the passion behind it, the interest behind it, the desire to make it happen. You cannot teach that. You can teach the skills and you can learn the skills, but nobody else is going to have that same passion for whatever it is that you are passionate about. I mean, and that struck me because it made me think about the work with Motivational Millennial and how much I really care about it. As we're pursuing our dreams and writing or creating music or whatever it is that we're doing, starting a business. It's just knowing that as unique manifestations of the universe, in my opinion, (laughs) we all have something special to give that only each of us can give. And many of us can have a communications degree or many of us can have an MBA, but there's something within us and it's like, it's knocking. It's like, it's there. It's calling that only we can give. And uh, that to me was one of the things that really struck me about what she said. Yeah, that really tied in with one of the big takeaways for me too, was if you are interested in something, but you might not know what, if that is your passion or your life calling, get really involved in every aspect of it and meet people and go places and do research. I feel like for her travel writing, that's what she did. She met travel writers and she traveled and she wrote. And that really helped cement that vision for her of part of her purpose and her passion. And I think what you're saying about the work we've been doing with Motivational Millennial it makes me think similarly of 
the way that you've been doing a lot of research and talking to academics and talking to people in companies and talking to young people who are of this generation and who are facing these issues. And I think the thing that drives it is that passion and that caring. So exactly, it's not that we already have organizational communication degrees or <laughs> that we have spent the last 20 years doing this research, although we have in sort of very experiential ways through our lives <laughs> been doing a lot of this research. But now that we're really getting into it in a more formal context, it's awesome and it's what gives it the longevity and the power to succeed is there's an interest there. So it's not just, okay, what boxes do I need to tick to say this is done? Really, it's like we care and we're interested, and so that means we're going to go above and beyond. So to your point, we might not be the perfect people from a qualifications if you had to design it in the abstract on paper. But on the flip side, we're perhaps some of the better suited people for it because we really do care and have a passion for it. Yeah, I think one of the things that, that you just mentioned is um, we may not have 20 years of experience yet. And I think right now, you know, a lot of millennials... Well, most like, we're all under the age of 35. And at this point in our lives and in our careers, or even if we're, you know, coming out of high school, some of us are coming out of high school and going into college. And we look at the people who are leading these amazing lives and are successful in their careers and have done et cetera, et cetera. And it's because many of them have been doing it for a long time. And the only way they got to where they had that experience is to just keep doing it. I mean, they had to start somewhere. It seems so obvious. But in the moment, when you're in your 20s or you're trying to you're coming out of college or whatever and you're figuring it all out, it's knowing that as long as you keep pursuing that, that interest and that passion, the thing that drives you and the thing that you love, eventually you'll become the expert. Eventually you'll become that person. 20 years from now or 30 years from now, you'll be that person that knows all of those things. And so it's counterproductive to say, okay, well, I'm, I don't have the experience, so I'm going to quit and do something else. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I don't have enough experience. It's like, well, you've got to stick to it. So you can have that experience and really see where it leads you. Yeah. And I think comparison is one of the things that prevents us from exploring it in the ways that it's really necessary to gain that experience because there's a great quote, I forget who said it, but something along the lines of if you compare your beginning to someone else's highlight reel, you'll always feel inferior. And I think that's true no matter what you're doing. If you're starting playing an instrument or writing or a business or speaking or any job and you compare where you are right now at the beginning of that process to someone who's been doing it for 20 years and looks insanely successful – of course you are going to feel inferior, and of course you're going to tell yourself, I'm bad at this, I should stop, I should quit. But that's so unfair because that other person was at your level or worse when they started. <laughs> so it's always a good reminder because especially with social media, it's so easy to delve into those comparisons mm -hmm. and everyone's posting their highlight reel all the time. And so it's really tempting to say, I'm not as good of a rapper as that person, or I'm not as good as a speaker, or I'm not as successful of a business coach, or an entrepreneur, or a teacher, or whatever your profession, or your hobby, or your dream is, but the only way you're going to get there is by keeping doing it, and I think even with the podcast... It's like when we were doing our motivational rap videos, we just have to start. I mean, you know, we can psych ourselves up that, oh, our format's not perfect, or, oh, we're not quite as comfortable and confident on the microphone, but the reality is we're not going to get that way if we just sit and worry about it, so we mm -hmm. might as well get going and try to provide real value and support for people and hope that something great or inspiring or motivating or challenging or thought-provoking comes out of it, so... Yeah, I mean, well, on that note, I'm just feeling really appreciative to all of you who are listening right now, and uh, we appreciate you joining us on the Motivational Millennial Podcast, and just know that if you want to reach out to us, you have additional questions or looking for additional resources, you can check out the website, motivationalmillennial.com, and uh, we hope to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. You can email us at ivy at motivationalmillennial.com or blake at motivationalmillennial.com. That's millennial, two L's, 
two N's. <laughs> three L's in total. Oh, awesome. <laughs> three, well, three L's, that's true. It does have one at the end, so uh, <laughs> definitely Google that if you're not sure. <laughs> but we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for being part of this community, and we hope to catch you soon. show notes and upcoming guests, or to learn more about Coactive Coaching, the blog, and our other awesome offerings, visit MotivationalMillennial.com. Keep in touch with us at Facebook.com slash MotivationalMillennial. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email with your thoughts, comments, and suggestions at podcast at MotivationalMillennial.com. And tell us who you might like to hear from, or if you think you or anyone you know would be good for the show. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is edited by Christy Hostler and Team Podcast. Our theme music was composed and performed by Blake Brandis. Have, Have a great, great week, Motivational, motivational millennials. millennials!